Good evening. Good evening, good evening. It's wonderful to see such a packed house. We've got overflow outside for the people who came later. We're very happy to have you here. My name is Matthew Scott. I'm president of the Carnegie Institution for Science. And we're sitting in our historic hall here, built in 1935, a place that has been the place for celebration of science for many, many years and will continue to be for many more. Uh, as you may have seen on some of the slides being shown, we have an ongoing series of free public lectures as well as many other events here. And if you haven't already, sign up downstairs for our website and uh, for our uh, newsletters and so on, and we'll be happy to tell you about the events, and I hope you join us for some of them. So tonight, I'm here to say thank you to you for coming, and thank you to the Council of Scientific Society Presidents for working together with us as partners. We're delighted with this new partnership uh, to have their meeting here, as it has been going on uh, today, and will go on the next day or so. Uh, and to work on projects together. And this is the first big event we've done together. And we're very happy about uh, this kind of event and particularly working with such a distinguished group of scientists. This, as you know, is also connected to the Kavli Institute. And we've had Kavli lectures here a number of times over the years. We have often an annual celebration of a Kavli awardee co-sponsored by the Norwegian Embassy in many cases. And so this is all about kind of homecoming, partnership, and friendship. And you're part of it tonight. And you're going to get to hear about some fascinating science in one of the hottest areas in biology. We're going to start with a quick three-minute video about the Carnegie Institution to tell you about our people and the kinds of things they do. And then we'll get on with the program. So thank you, Michael. Carnegie scientists explore the outermost reaches of space, the mysterious depths of the Earth, and the origins and mechanisms of life. Our brilliant and dynamic teams of scientists transform the landscape of discovery with their unbridled passion, insatiable curiosity, and never-ending quest for knowledge. With limited teaching, administrative, and grant pressures, Carnegie scientists concentrate on research and are empowered to go their own way. Our scientists are chosen for unique skills and boldness. Their amazing discoveries, spanning more than a century, demonstrate the power of freedom. Carnegie astronomers, astrophysicists, and planetary scientists are committed to finding answers about our universe. From the expansion of the universe, discovered by Carnegie's Edwin Hubble, to the chemistry of stars and the diversity of exoplanets, Carnegie's distinguished investigators probe distant reaches of space and time. From curiosity comes discovery. Geophysicists, geochemists, and ecologists use cutting-edge instrumentation in our laboratories and venture out to nature's laboratories, stunning rainforests, ancient rock formations, flowing lava lakes, and beckoning coral reefs. They explore Earth history and dynamics with passion and determination, unprecedented independence from short-term pressures, close collaboration, and interdisciplinary approaches set Carnegie scientists apart. Taking risks and using new approaches, their findings have critical implications for understanding Earth's properties and guiding policy. Carnegie scientists make outsized contributions to unlocking the secrets of life and laying the foundation for improving it. Carnegie's Nobel Prize winning Barbara McClintock made discoveries about chromosomes that completely change biology and medicine. With latitude to undertake long-term, higher-risk projects, our researchers investigate the molecular basis of life. From computation and genomics, to advanced microscopy and engineering, to remote sensing tools and forest canopy field work, we construct a clearer picture of plant, animal, and microbial life, diverse ecosystems, and changes driven by human activities. Carnegie investigators are intrepid adventurers who pursue their goals even as they mentor and train the next generation of scientists. They are free, free to question, to wonder, 
to creatively pursue ideas from the vast universe to the subatomic world. Our scientists redefine the pursuit of what's possible for us, our planet, our universe. We explore the past to understand the present and inform the future. CSSP member societies are represented by their presidents, presidents elect, and recent past presidents of leading scientific societies and federations whose combined membership totals over one million scientists worldwide. Founded in 1973, CSSP has served as a center for national science leadership development, a strong voice in support of science, and the premier forum for national science policy development and open, substantive exchanges on current issues encompassing the full spectrum of science, engineering, and mathematics. CSSP is committed to advancing leadership in science and technology and to establishing policies and programs that will ensure a bright future for the 21st century science. Tonight, it is my great honor before we begin our Fred Cavley Science of, of the Frontiers, at the Frontiers Lecture, to introduce a man whose entire life has been aimed at ensuring a bright future for science. That man is Dr. Do John Holdren, Assistant to the President for Science and Technology, Director of the White House Office of Science and Technology, and Co-Chair of the President's Council on Science and Technology Policy. <coughs> He is this year's recipient of the CSSP Supportive Science Award. This is the highest honor CSSP confers and most recently was bestowed on President Barack Obama. The award honors an individual who merits recognition for outstanding and dedicated support of US science, free science communication, and the support of basic research. Dr. Holdren's seven years as science advisor to President Obama have been filled with numerous accomplishments that have advanced the U.S. and global scientific enterprise. <clears throat> His work on the causes and consequences of global environmental change, energy technologies and policies, ways to reduce the dangers from nuclear weapons and materials and science and technology policy have made the world a much more sustainable and safer place. <clears throat> Dr. Holdren has had a very distinguished career pri prior to being confirmed as President Obama's science advisor and director of the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. He was, he was uh, voted into that office by the Senate on March 19, 2009 by a unanimous vote. Consider that. <laughs> In today's political environment, there is no such thing as a unanimous vote anymore. Dr. Holgren was the Teresa and John Hines professor, professor of Environmental Policy at the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University, Director of the Science, Technology, and Public Policy Program at the, at the school's Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs, 
Professor of Environmental Science and Policy in Harvard's Department of Earth and Planetary Sciences, and director of the independent nonprofit Woods Hole Research Center. From 1993 to 1996, he co-led the Interdisciplinary Graduate Program in Energy and Resources at the University of California at Berkeley. Dr. Holdren was chair of the Executive Committee of the Pugwash Conference in Science and World Affairs from 1987 to 1997 and delivered the Nobel Peace Prize acceptance lecture on behalf of the Pugwash Conferences in December 1995. From 1993 to 2003, he was chair of the Committee on International Security and Arms Control of the National Academy of Sciences and co-chair of the bipartisan National Commission on Energy Policy from 2002 to 2007. He has so many awards and honors, I can't name them all. But I would like to, to note that he has received the MacArthur Prize Fellowship in 1981 the Volvo Environment Prize in 1993 with Paul Ehrlich, the Kavli Foundation Award in Science and Environmental Policy in 1999, the Tyler Prize for Environmental Achievement in 2000, and the seventh annual Heinz Award in Public Policy in 2001. What an incredible list of awards. He's a member of the National Academy of Sciences, the National Academy of Engineering, American Philosophical Society and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, um, as well as a foreign member of the Royal Society of London and the Indian National Academy of Engineering. Dr. Holdren, please join me and CSSP's Chair-Elect Bob Barsley to receive this award. It's a great honor, obviously, to receive this award, and it's a great pleasure to be piggybacking on the enormous audience that Jennifer has attracted. Uh, I will be brief. Uh, this is, for me, a sort of a valedictory because I've spoken a couple times before uh, to the Council of Science Society Presidents, and uh, this is probably my last shot at that. So I wanted to make a few remarks about the, uh, what we've been trying to do in the Obama administration uh, in science and technology policy and what is left, uh, what is left to do. Uh, I think everybody in this room remembers the President's first inaugural <coughs> speech in which he said, we will restore science to its rightful place in my administration. And as noted at the bottom, science uh, really was a, a shorthand for science, technology, and innovation. And he started out uh, immediately uh, doing a whole series of things issuing executive orders, issuing presidential memoranda, putting priority on scientific integrity, <coughs> STEM education and inclusion, open <coughs> data, tec technical innovation for economic recovery and growth, on energy and climate change, biomedicine and public health, international cooperation in science and technology, rebalancing NASA to put the science back in rocket science was the way I put it at the time. Uh, and exploiting modern information technology and private sector innovation talent to improve the responsiveness and the effectiveness of government. He did a lot of other things. He put a huge boost for science, technology, and innovation, over $100 billion into the Recovery Act, and then protected science, technology, and innovation budgets as best he could in a very difficult uh, budgetary environment. He rebuilt the White House leadership in science, technology, and innovation and recruited top talent to other positions across the executive branch. He actually appointed five Nobel laureates in science in his initial tranche of presidential appointments and more than 25 other members of the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine. And he used the presidential pulpit and the White House venue to an extraordinary degree to lift up, to promote 
science, technology, and innovation. Spoke about them in both inaugural addresses in every State of the Union address. Talked twice to annual meetings of the National Academy of Sciences. No other president has ever done that. Um, multiple major speeches, uh, dedicated speeches, on topics in science, technology, and innovation. Uh, White House science fairs, six of them. There had never been a White House science fair before. Celebrating young scientists, engineers, uh, innovators. Two astronomy nights on the White House lawn. Uh, all kinds of celebrations in the Oval Office and in the East Wing of science, technology, and innovation superstars, and not just the Nobel laureates and the Cavalry Prize winners, but kids, the Intel uh, talent search finalists, the, um, the math leads, middle school uh, mathematics champions, and so on. And he launched an unprecedented number of science, technology, and innovation initiatives. Uh, the next slide, and I'm not going to read this to you, you can read faster than I can talk in any case, and I'll post these slides on the White House website tomorrow, uh, so they will be publicly available. But just a huge array of initiatives in STEM education, information technology <coughs> and computing, innovation for the economy, uh, biomedicine and health alone, I don't think there's ever been a series of innovations as extensive and far-reaching as the President has launched in that domain. And of course, energy and environment and national security and international science and technology. The agenda, of course, is not finished. This is uh, my partial list of what we still have to get across the finish line. This is not all going to get done in the, um, in the, in the remaining <laughs> 36 weeks. Um, <laughs> terrible thing. I was asked in an interview the other day uh, what my greatest regret was in nearly eight years of advising this president on science and technology. And I said, my greatest regret is that he can't serve three terms. Um, <laughs> There are some persistent obstacles to getting done what we need to get done in this space. Inadequate funding for research and development, both public and private. Inadequate translation of advances made in research and development into widespread practical application. Underrepresentation of women and ethnic minorities in STEM fields. Underrepresentation of science, technology, and innovation talent in many federal departments, agencies, and offices and poor public and policymaker understanding of science, technology, and innovation. Poor understanding of their role in meeting societal challenges, particularly poor understanding of the importance of basic research, and poor understanding of the value of international cooperation in science and technology. We've worked on all of those, but there is much more to be done. There are some really big opportunities ahead. One is harnessing the full potential of partnerships. This has been a theme for President Obama from the beginning. Uh, partnerships across levels of government, across sectors of society, international partnerships to overcome those obstacles. The opportunity to continue the infiltration across the government of science, technology, and innovation talent by aggressive recruiting. The opportunity to apply research on what works in STEM inspiration, teaching, mentoring, and training to increase participation in STEM careers and to create a science-savvy citizenry. The opportunity, and you'll hear some more about this, I believe, from Jennifer, to exploit recent advantage, advances in biomedical sciences and big data to drastically improve health care. And finally, the opportunity to build on the momentum of the Paris Conference, the 21st Conference of the Parties to the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, and the recent rapid growth of renewable energy deployment worldwide, to fashion what will really amount to a revolution in <coughs> clean energy. That's the end of my slide. I simply wanted to say in closing that I have had an incredible boss in this run. President Obama richly deserved uh, the award that he got last year, indeed deserves it more than I. Uh, he is, in my judgment, the most science savvy president since Thomas Jefferson, and there's a lot more science to be savvy about today. Thank you very much. suggest that we put John Holgren in the rock star category. Is that all right with you? Thank you very much. Uh, and, that, and now it's, it is my honor to introduce, <laughs> and now it is my honor to introduce tonight's special speaker, Dr. Jennifer Doudna, who is the Fred Cavley Science at the Frontiers Lecturer presented by the Council of Scientific <coughs> Society Presidents 
through the, gener the, through the generosity of the Cavley Foundation and in collaboration with the Carnegie Institution for Science. Dr. Doudna is the Li Ka Shing Ch uh, Chancellor's Chair in Biomedical and Health Sciences, and she is a Professor of Chemistry and Molecular and Cell Biology at the University of California at Berkeley. She has been an investigator. She has been an investigator with the Howard Hughes Medical Institute since 1997, and is a member of the Physical Biosciences Division at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. Dr. Doudna received her BA in chemistry from Pomona College in 1985, her PhD in biochemistry from Harvard University with Jack W. Sostak. Um, she did her postdoctoral work at the Thomas, with Thomas Check at the University of Colorado in Boulder. She joined the faculty of Yale University in 1994. She was promoted to the position of Henry Ford II Professor of Molecular Biophysics and Biochemistry at Yale in 2000 and joined the faculty of the University of California at Berkeley in 2002. Dr. Doudna has received many honors and awards. She is a member of the National Academy of Sciences, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the National Academy of Medicine, and the National Academy of Inventors. She is a recipient of such prestigious awards as the NSF Waterman Award, the Lurie Prize from the Foundation for the National Institutes of Health, and with Charpentier, the Paul Janssen Award for Biomedical Research, the Breakthrough Prize in Life Sciences, the Princess of Astorius Award, and the Gruber Prize in Genetics. She's also received the Massey Prize and the L'Oreal UNESCO International Prize for Women in Science. Her Cavley lecture is titled CRISPR Biology and the New Era of Genome Engineering. Her research seeks to understand how RNA molecules control the expression of genetic information. Her research led to insights about CRISPR-Cas9 mediated bacterial immunity that enabled her lab and that of her collaborator, Manuel Charpentier, to design this system for effective, for efficient genome engineering in animals, plants, creating a transformative technology that is revolutionizing the field of genetics molecular biology and medicine. Science Magazine named this genome editing technology Science Breakthrough of 2015. Dr. Doudna was, was also named one of Time Magazine's 100 most influential people in the world together with Charpentier. I know we are going to enjoy this talk tonight after Dr. Doudna speaks. Oh, I'm sorry, after Doudna speaks, we will have a question. <laughs> it was bound to happen, you know, the very last paragraph. <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, I know we are gonna enjoy this talk. Uh, we will have a question and answer session moderated by Frank Cessno, an award-winning journalist who is director of the School of Media and Public Affairs at George Washington University following your presentation. <laughs> So with no further ado, Dr. Doudna. Well, good evening, everyone. It's really a pleasure to be here with you. And I, I first want to thank the CSSP, the Cavley, and the, and the Carnegie for the opportunity to come and talk to you about our science and about my thoughts about sort of where this technology is going in the future. And the story I want to tell you tonight, as you'll, as you'll see, is really a story, I would say, of small science, and uh, science that began in a very different place than it ended up. And that's partly what makes it near and dear to my heart, is that I've always been a, a, a scientist interested in the fundamentals of biology. And through the course of our research and curiosity-driven questions about how bacteria fight viral infection, we were able to uncover a pathway that can be now harnessed as an exciting technology for changing the DNA inside of cells. So I want to begin by oh, let's the slides here. So um, I want to begin by um, just sort of this 
describing what we think about as biologists in terms of understanding cells and organisms, and then share with you my own journey on the path of understanding bacterial adaptive immunity and how that led to the CRISPR technology for genome engineering. And so I wanted to start um, it off by just pointing out, for those of you that, that don't think about this every day, that, um, that DNA is the code of life. It's the molecule inside of cells that encodes all of the information that cells need to grow and divide and become a tissue or become a whole organism. And so ever since uh, people have been trying to understand the molecular basis for life, we've really always been sort of drawn back to DNA at, at some level. And, um, I, and when we think about DNA, we, uh, you know, we can't help but be awed by the beautiful structure of this molecule. And again, to remind you that this is a molecule that consists of two strands of chemical letters that wind around each other, and they form a double helix, as was shown in the 1950s. And what makes this structure particularly both beautiful and informative about biology is that the chemical letters in the DNA pair with each other in such a way that we can understand how one strand <coughs> of DNA in the double helix can be copied into, uh, uh, into the other strand, because one letter always pairs with the other, A's with T's, G's with C's. And ever since the discovery of the structure of DNA and the understanding of its importance in biology, scientists have had the idea that wouldn't it be amazing if one could actually manipulate or change the DNA in cells? Because we know that changes in DNA lead to changes in cells and changes in whole organisms, and in humans, of course, can lead to uh, genetic diseases and to differences between all of us. So the thing I want to pose to you, the question I want to pose to you, and what I want to talk to you about tonight is imagining that we had a technology for changing the DNA inside of cells, much like we might change the words in a text document. So you know, you know that in your word processor, if you see a typo in the document, you can easily fix it by replacing a letter or a word or moving, moving words around. What if you could do the same thing with the letter code of DNA inside of cells? And I would say that science is really, you know, biology has really been working in that direction for decades by understanding how cells manipulate DNA. Of course, the work of Barbara McClintock here at the Carnegie was one of the first um, pieces of effort. her work showed that DNA is very uh, much more dynamic than people appreciated at the time. And what I'll show you tonight is that we now have a technology that really brings us to this point where we can control DNA at the level of a single letter in the entire uh, DNA sequence of a human cell with 3 billion uh, base pairs of DNA. And where did this technology come from? It really came about not through a focused effort to discover how to do this, but actually from something that sounds completely unrelated and, and sort of obscure, which was the question, how do bacteria fight off viral infection in their environment? And so I want to point out that <coughs> Bacteria, like most other organisms that we know about, including humans, face viruses in their environment all the time. And when a virus lands on a cell, in this example, I'm showing you uh, an example of a virus landing on the surface of a bacterial cell, the way it infects the cell is actually to inject its genetic material, in this case its DNA, into the cell. And then the DNA, of course, contains the program required to build more viruses. So it takes over the cell's machinery and begins to build more viruses. And that eventually leads to, uh, to destruction of the cell. So bacteria, like, like other organisms that have to, to face this threat in their environment, have evolved a number of pathways to fight off viral infection. And in a pathway, you might think that bacteria have been studied for a long time and, and know we already know all about this, but it turns out that about 10 years ago, a new pathway for bacterial defense against viruses came to the attention of just a few people 
who were uh, looking into this in the biological world, and that was a pathway called CRISPR. And so to, to explain this, I want to I just uh, point out, so this is a cartoon that illustrates the, so the black squiggly line is, is meant to represent the circular DNA molecule or genome inside of a bacterial cell. And a colleague of mine at, at the University of California, Berkeley, named Jillian Banfield, was working away on understanding bacteria in interesting environments in, that were not in the laboratory. So she, her, her, uh, her research group goes to places where bacteria are growing at pH 1 and at very cold uh, temperatures or very high pressures, things like that. Many of these organisms have never been identified. They've never, it's not possible to culture them in the laboratory. So the way she studies them is to take, uh, sam collect samples of those organisms and then <coughs> sequence all of the DNA that's present in the sample. And by piecing together the DNA sequences found in those samples, she could actually reassemble these kinds of circular chromosomes and figure out what the DNA code of those organisms is and also what kinds of viruses they're interacting with. And her research led to an interesting observation that a few other people doing similar research were making at around the same time. And that was that in many bacteria, there's an interesting pattern of DNA sequences inside the chromosome of the cell. And what I'm showing you in this slide is, is the pattern represented by black diamonds, which are uh, DNA letters that are uh, sequences of letters that are repeated over and over again. And in between the repeats, are sequences that are unique in the chromosome, and in fact, sort of unique in, in, um, in the bacterial world. And so people had, a few labs had noticed these types of sequences. Nobody knew what they were. They had been called CRISPRs, which is an acronym that stands for clusters of regularly interspaced short palindromic repeats, a big mouthful, um, but represents this interesting pattern of DNA sequences. And in 2005, Jill Banfield called me in my office one day to tell me that not only was she identifying a lot of these CRISPR sequences in bacterial DNA samples, but also that the first clue to what they were doing had been found, which was namely in work published that year, the observation that the unique sequences in the, represented by the colored boxes come from viruses in the environment of these organisms. So it really was the first hint that what these unusual sequences were um, is actually a, effectively a genetic vaccination card for cells, a way cells can keep a record of DNA from viruses that have infected them over time and pass that information along to their progeny. And so the question was, why do they do that? And one idea that came up in discussions among a few scientists at the time was that maybe these actually represent some kind of bacterial immune system, a way that bacteria can acquire DNA from viruses and then somehow use that information to protect cells in the future. And what made it look um, suspiciously like some kind of a conserved system in bacteria was that next door to these repetitive loci called CRISPRs, there were very typically CAS or CRISPR associated genes that encode proteins that were found neighboring these repetitive sites. So it really looked like some kind of a pathway, perhaps, that cells had maintained for a purpose. So why did Jill call me about this? And to explain that, I have to, I have to uh, make a little segue to uh, tell you about research that I've been interested in for my whole career, which is namely the function of molecules called RNA inside of cells. And, um, and I'll just, I'll just uh, preface this by saying that Jill Banfield at the time suspected that the way these viral sequences might be employed in cells was at the level of RNA to help recognize viral molecules that could get into the cell and try to infect cells and somehow use that information to protect uh, the cells. So to explain what, what I mean by that, I want to just um, show you a, a slide that illustrates what we call a central dogma of molecular biology. And this is greatly simplified from what we now understand actually happens inside of cells. But, but for 
students that, that you know, have taken uh, a biology class in high school, this is often what they learn, is that on the left-hand side, you know, we have DNA uh, molecules that store genetic information inside cells that are responsible for replicating that information accurately and passing it along to progeny cells. And the way that the DNA information is actually employed in the cell is by the cell copying it into other molecules. So first of all, copying it into uh, molecules called RNA, which have the same type of uh, sequence of letters that can form interactions with uh, DNA sequences of letters, very much uh, sort of to form uh, helical structures like you see for DNA. And in many cases, these RNA molecules encode proteins, so they can be translated into proteins that become the functional molecules of the cell. But I've always been interested in sort of this process shown right here, which is when, um, when the RNA molecules that are copied from DNA are actually functional in their own right. They, don't, they aren't simply serving as uh, the, the code for proteins, but they actually form interesting structures and they do interesting things on their own. So knowing this about me, Jill uh, said, you know, maybe these uh, these CRISPR sequences are being converted into RNA molecules that are being, being employed in bacteria to recognize viruses. So I got intrigued by that possibility. And so in a very, sort of very small scale project, just a couple of uh, people in my lab that started working on this, we, uh, we, we uh, started to investigate this hypothesis of a bacterial adaptive immune system and how it might operate. And what emerged over the next several years in research from just a, uh, sort of a handful of labs around the world at the time, is that bacteria that have a CRISPR sequence indeed have the ability to adapt to viruses and infect them. And this slide shows three steps in the adaptive immune system. First of all, detection of foreign DNA that gets injected into the cell, say from the virus. Incorporation of little bits of the viral DNA into the CRISPR sequence. And then uh, a, a copy is made of that virally, uh, that sort of recorded sequence of viral DNA in the form of RNA that can assemble with proteins to form guided, sort of RNA guided complexes that search through the cell. They're like sentinels that go looking for DNA sequences that have a match to the letter sequence in the RNA, which remember comes originally from the virus. And when a match is found, that allows this interference uh, complex to grab on to the viral DNA and allow the associated proteins to make a cut in the DNA. So it's a fascinating way that uh, bacteria can actually acquire immunity to viruses by storing their DNA in chromosome. <coughs> and so that led to a, a series of, of experiments that we worked on in my lab to understand how this actually works. And, um, and eventually to a, a chance a meeting that I had with Emmanuel Charpentier, who is a medical microbiologist, who was studying a particular type of organism that had a very interesting CRISPR system in its chromosome, in which there was a single Cas gene called Cas9 that had been identified genetically at that time to be critical for the adaptive immune system to function in that organism. So when, when she and I met at a conference in 2011, we decided to put our uh, complementary types of research expertise together to collaborate to figure out the function of Cas9. And so in a really fun collaboration that, that uh, was carried out really across many thousands of miles with her student Christoph Chelinski in Vienna at the time and, and Martin Janek of Lusak in my lab in Berkeley, these two uh, scientists teamed up to test function of the Cas9 protein. And what they figured out, and is diagrammed here on the slide, is that the Cas9 protein, which is shown in the blue, uh, sort of that blue blocky uh, structure, is a protein that, whose job is to grab onto DNA at places in the DNA sequence that match a 20 nucleotide or 20 letter sequence in an RNA molecule, which is the, um, I don't know if I can point here, Right here. So this molecule right here. So here's the, the guide sequence in the RNA. And this is an RNA molecule that would originally come from the CRISPR locus. So this would be a sequence that would be originally uh, derived from the virus in principle. 
And when this protein uh, finds a matching sequence to this RNA, it unwinds the DNA double helix to allow two molecular blades in the protein to make a cut in each strand of the DNA. So it breaks the DNA, and in bacteria, that allows the DNA to eventually be destroyed. Now, um, we figured out a couple of things that were very interesting about the way this chemical reaction with DNA operates. First of all, we found out that it doesn't work with just this RNA molecule right here. We have to have a second RNA called tracer, which is the red molecule, that is important for forming a structure in the RNA. Again, this is a base pairing interaction, very much like the double helical DNA structure that I showed you, except it's an RNA. And that uh, structure binds to the Cas9 protein and allows this whole targeting complex to assemble. So you have to have that second uh, RNA molecule. And once, uh, so Martin Janek was a very good biochemist. He was turning away at these natural uh, RNA molecules to figure out what was minimally required for this reaction to work in the test tube. And that led to the realization that we could simplify the system compared to what nature has done. And the idea was to link together the part of this uh, RNA molecule that provides the DNA recognition information on this end with the part of the RNA that's important for assembly with the Cas9 protein over here to create a single guide RNA molecule that could bind and form this sentinel complex with the Cas9 protein and have the targeting information contained right here. And why was that interesting? Well, once Martin had done this experiment, had this idea and did this experiment in the lab, we found out that we could very easily program this protein, which is sort of like a molecular scalpel, to find and cut right here. And because this is now a single RNA, it was a two-component system, a single protein and a single RNA. And the RNA acts like a programmer for the protein. It can be easily changed to direct the protein to a different piece of DNA to make a cut. And for us, that was really the moment when this project went from a fundamental research project to curiosity-driven discovery to recognizing that we could actually harness this as a really exciting technology. And to make that connection, I want to I show you a couple more things. So first of all, how does this, how does this DNA recognition actually work? And I want to show you here a 3D printed <coughs> model of the Cas9 protein. So first, this complex, how small is it? It's really small, right? We can't really <laughs> see it with, we certainly can't see it with a light microscope. We can see maybe little specks using an electron microscope, but to really understand the molecular structure of this complex, we have to use a technique called X-ray crystallography. And this model is built using actual atomic coordinates that come from an X-ray crystallographic structure. And so what you're looking at here is the protein in white, and its guiding RNA is the orange molecule. And that complex searches through cells looking for a DNA sequence that matches the sequence on the end of the guide RNA. When that occurs, it grabs onto the DNA, so you can see this beautiful uh, double helical structure here running uh, through, the, through the protein. And um, at the place where the sequence in the DNA matches the RNA, an RNA-DNA helix forms inside the protein. That's how recognition actually occurs. And that displaces the other strand of the DNA and positions two molecular blades in the protein to make a precise double-stranded break in the DNA. So it's a cleaver that comes in and cuts the DNA when this kind of chemical interaction actually occurs. So, um, so that's great, but how does that, how does that relate to, um, to what we talked about earlier, genome engineering? And, and to explain that, I need to, to show you that uh, uh, this sort of connects to a, a, a long and very interesting line of research by many, many labs that have been studying how plants and animal cells and our cells deal with double-stranded DNA breaks, which occur all the time naturally during cell division, but also can occur due to DNA damage. And so cells have evolved very nice, sophisticated machinery to repair double-stranded breaks in DNA. And in this example, so here, if this is a segment of DNA inside of a cell, if it gets 
broken, cells can repair the break by repair pathways that include a um, mechanism that chemically pays bands back together, sometimes with a small disruption in the DNA sequence at the site of repair, or in some cases integrates a new segment of DNA at the site of the break to actually incorporate new DNA sequence into the DNA at exactly the place where it was originally broken. So many scientists had appreciated that if you wanted to alter the DNA sequence inside of cells, the way to do it would be to figure out how to introduce double-stranded breaks at places in the DNA where you might like to effect a change. And several very interesting strategies have been, evolved, uh, have been developed, uh, particularly recently, for doing this that involve engineered proteins. Proteins that you don't have to worry about these acronyms here, but engineered proteins that can be designed in the laboratory to be able to bind to particular uh, DNA sequences. And I can't help but saying, I know Carl uh, Pedro is here tonight, and the zinc finger nucleases right here were actually based on work that his lab originally did to understand exactly how these proteins interact with particular uh, DNA sequences or DNA letters. There, these can be very effective technologies, but they had not been widely adopted for genome editing. The reason was they just require a, a high enough level of sophistication about protein engineering time and money to develop proteins for every experiment that many labs, including my own, had looked at those technologies, thought they looked really exciting, but didn't feel like we actually had the expertise and the money and the time to, to, uh, to, to actually employ them. And so with Cas9, the idea was here we have a single protein that can be reprogrammed for different DNA sequence recognition and cleavage by simply changing the short sequence of guide RNA that it binds to, something that any students, uh, even in molecular biology, can do. And these days, you know, they type these sequences into their iPhone and they can mail it off and get the DNA or RNA molecule the next day. And so it's very, it's a trivial thing to do. So that was the idea. And, um, and so what happened uh, next was, was truly amazing. So we proposed this in a publication in 2012. And before the end of 2012, there were already six manuscripts submitted to scientific <coughs> journals that had employed this method for engineering a variety of different kinds of cells, including human cells, human stem cells, uh, mouse cells, plant cells. And, um, and very quickly thereafter, many labs around the world began to adopt this technology for genome engineering in their system of interest. So why did this technology take off so quickly? And, and I really like to, I like to point out three things, that three sort of points that, that kind of explain this, I think. One is what I like to call software versus hardware. So where earlier technologies were hardwired, requiring new protein engineering for each experiment, here we had a system that's more analogous to software, a, pro, a single protein reprogrammable by using these short sequences of RNA lots of different kinds of applications in various systems. And as we've discovered over the last few years uh, investigating how this actually works, a rapid and accurate DNA targeting mechanism that really lends itself to harnessing as a, as a technology. So let me show you a short video that illustrates uh, how we imagine that this system operates inside of uh, animal and plant cells. It also points out some of the questions that we still have about how this bacterial system is functioning inside uh, a cell that has a nucleus, like a human cell, for example. <laughs> and so this is showing, uh, this is a video made by Janet Owasa at the University of Utah for us. We're zooming into a cell, and of course, in a plant or animal cell, the DNA is inside the nucleus, so we're going inside the nucleus, and the DNA is highly packaged in chromatin. These uh, structures called nucleosomes. And somehow, this bacterial enzyme Cas9, with its guide RNA, has to search through all of the DNA of the cell to find a single sequence that matches the sequence of the guide RNA. When that occurs, it binds to the DNA, unwinds it, and forms that structure that I showed you, cuts the DNA, and then hands off the cleaved ends of the DNA molecule to repair machinery, repair enzymes in the cell that can fix the break and 
and that example actually insert a new piece of DNA at the site where the break originally occurred. And remarkably, this system operates in effectively any kind of cell where people have tried to, to employ it. So it's a very democratizing technique. It's very inexpensive to use and allows scientists to now make very precise changes to the DNA itself for research and other kinds of applications. And, and I just want to now point out sort of what people are, are doing with this. So um, it's been used in a wide variety of, of, of different systems, uh, plants and, and animals that are important for agricultural and, uh, animals we uh, like to have as pets, and uh, uh, for engineering organisms like uh, fungi that are used for things like uh, green chemical production or, or sustainable biofuel production. Uh, just about two weeks ago, I opened up Nature Magazine and there was this article about a company in the Midwest that has made a CRISPR mushroom. This is a mushroom that doesn't brown when you cut it because they were able to knock out or disrupt a single gene that's important for that browning process. And what, why this was uh, in science was actually not that they had made this, this, uh, this, uh, this mushroom, but actually that the USDA had decided that it would not be regulated because it doesn't contain any foreign DNA. So in the US, this would not be considered a genetically modified organism. Shortly after that, I got an email from a, a prominent uh, company that is in, uh, agric in the agricultural sector informing me that they had 25 uh, plants of this nature in the pipeline, engineered with CRISPR, with products that will be uh, coming out uh, very soon. And they were, of course, thrilled that the USDA is not <laughs> So what about in humans, and what about for biomedicine? So, uh, you know, we, we understand that now that we can use the CRISPR system for engineering cells like stem cells that might be useful for, for treating disease in the future, animals that are important for modeling human disease, and maybe in the not too distant future for treating uh, per, perhaps uh, actual patients. And there were, there were three publications that appeared in Science Magazine at the end of last year in which three different uh, research groups had shown that they could actually use this system for correcting the mutation that causes a muscular dystrophy-like disease in a mouse model of this disease. So giving a lot of people uh, sort of the idea that we're, we're just showing the way, I think, towards the uh, clinical application of this uh, kind of technology. Still years away, for sure, but I think it's exciting to see that we're already uh, to the point where this can be employed in animal systems for testing. But what about a different kind of application? What about an application where, uh, we, where we actually make changes to, to DNA, not in fully differentiated uh, cells or adult cells, but cells that are actually developing, a developing organism. We call this germline editing. And this is showing an example of germline editing that was done by Russell Vance, a colleague of mine at UC Berkeley, who was doing this in a mouse, a fertilized mouse egg. And this is a, a pipette that's holding the fertilized egg over here, and we've got a needle coming in and injecting the editing molecules right into the cell. And then the uh, DNA gets edited, because this is a developing uh, embryo, all of the resulting cells in this organism end up having a <coughs> modification. And not only that, those changes can be transmitted to the next uh, generation. Here's an example. Here was the outcome of this, uh, this actual experiment was uh, is shown right here, where in this experiment, the Vance lab targeted a gene important for the black coat color in these mice. And the resulting pups that were born from that uh, editing experiment, most of them actually had a double knockout. Both copies of that gene had been disrupted by the CRISPR-Cas9 system to create uh, albino mice. And when these, uh, the DNA from these mice was sequenced, they had a change of exactly the place that was desired uh, that was cleaved by uh, Cas9. And they can transmit now that genetic change to their progeny. So, um, you know, I, I, when this, uh, e, this was a, an experiment Russell did in early 2013, and I showed this picture to members of my lab who were, you know, people like me who are biochemists and structural biologists, and half of them said, 
wow, that's really cool. And half of them said, wow, that's really scary. <laughs> and it was kind of both, cool, right? Because you know, this is, you, you kind of you see very visually the power of this technology, but you also realize the profound uh, nature of what's being done. And this really came home to me even more um, about a year later in early 2014, when I got a call one day in my office at Berkeley from a reporter who said that a scientific paper was about to be published in which a group had been able to do that kind of germline editing in monkeys and had been able to efficiently change the DNA in monkeys in such a way that those changes can be uh, transmitted. They were germline modifications. And it was really that experiment at that point that really motivated me to uh, ask myself um, you know, about how we as a society were going to grapple with this technology and how to employ it ethically and safely and appropriately in the future. And so I've been involved in you know, a number of, of now uh, global discussions around this question. What should we do now that we have a really exciting technology that allows precision genome engineering in effectively any kind of cell, including in uh, germ cells and human embryos. And so about uh, a year and a half ago, now with several, with a number of colleagues, we, we held a meeting, a one day uh, meeting about this with, with a, a fairly small group of scientists from around the US and published what we called a prudent path for employment of this genome editing technology in germline cells. And this, uh, He's really argued that scientists should voluntarily agree not to use the CRISPR Cas or any other in, uh, genome engineering technology in human embryos for clinical use, meaning to make a modified person, uh, until the technology and its, its uh, and all of the ethical implications that go along with that kind of use could be fully uh, discussed and considered. And so I, I've been uh, really involved in this. I was very pleased that the National Academies of several countries got together and organized a summit here in Washington in December of, of this past year to discuss this issue. And it's very much an active area of consideration right now around the world. In fact, a number of foreign governments have been involved in discussing this and many, many different societies that have considered this issue and are thinking about um, how to proceed. And as we talk tonight, there are now four countries that I'm aware of that have actually approved the use of CRISPR-Cas9 for human embryo editing for research purposes. And those are Sweden, the UK, uh, China, and Japan. So it's coming. And I think it's, uh, it's something that we all have to be really thinking about and understanding and considering what we think uh, the appropriate response is in our society to an exciting powerful technology. I'll close by just acknowledging uh, a great group of people in my lab. So this is a um, picture that shows my students at our 20th uh, anniversary of, of my lab um, that was held uh, two summers ago in my hometown of Hawaii, and, uh, which I love so happy, I guess. And, uh, and then you know we've had great collaborations, and I just want to end by pointing out that I think science today especially, really it relies on great collaborations because many of the projects we work on involve expertise that could never be contained in the laboratory, and that's certainly true in my case. And also, I, you know, we couldn't do anything without funding, and I'm incredibly grateful to both public and private funding for giving us um, not a huge amount of money, but enough that we could get started on what we thought was a really interesting uh, project but had no idea of where it would lead. So thanks very much, and I look forward to the conversation we're going to have. So I've been told that uh, we have um, roughly 700 people in the audience, so we can't all ask questions. <laughs> However, I do. I would like to invite people that are in the overflow room if they have questions uh, that they. Frank, I guess this is okay. Yeah. All right. They can't fire me. <laughs> uh, so I would say, if there are people in the overflow room and you have questions, please come into the audience to ask or to the main room to ask questions. So let's go ahead and let's go ahead and start it. Do, do people have questions? If you do, please. 
We talk first. Got it. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I got here so early. Uh, first of all, congratulations, uh, both on all the work that you've done and on being a rock star, because uh, now we know what you do in your spare time. Um, this is fascinating. Uh, it's fascinating what you've discovered, and it's fascinating what you've developed, and it's fascinating that you tee up such a difficult question. Let's just start for a few minutes, though, on where you think this is going. You said in a few years, pointed out, Sweden, UK, China, and Japan are already working on this. How far are we from clinical applications for human beings, do you think? I think one, one point to make that I want to make sure people do really understand is that, is that I think you know, when we talk about clinical applications today, we're really, at least I'm talking about uh, use in adults or kids, you know, patients where we're treating the tissue, we're not uh, creating changes that would be transmissible to future generations. Not germline editing. There, I think the opportunities are, are, are truly exciting. Um, we, I gave you the example of muscular dystrophy, but what I actually think is a more likely uh, early target for this as a therapeutic is probably something like a sickle cell trait, which is a disease of the blood where editing can in principle be carried out outside of the body with uh, blood that's removed from a patient, edited validated that the cells are edited correctly and then we introduce. So I think that's where we're likely to see uh, perhaps the initial uh, timeline on that. What do you think? Well, you know, uh, there are a, a number of academic labs and companies that are moving in that direction and I hear from my colleagues that people are talking about, you know, 12 to 18 months to file the first investigational new drug or IMD request with the FDA. So we'll see if that happens. But about 
about this technology is that it's <coughs> easy to obtain. It's uh, available from a nonprofit called AdGene, and people can tr you know, trivially get these reagents if they want to do experiments. There's a company called Indiegogo that sells a kit to do CRISPR editing. Kids, if you want to have your kids do this. This could be done by high school kids, right? High school, or this is actually a kid for elementary school. Elementary school. <laughs> I don't know what they do to their parents. I don't know what they do to their parents. So it's, you know, it's easy to use. And so it means that you know, we really can't, even if we wanted to, we can't put this genie back in the box. So I think we really want to uh, think about how to go forward with it, but in ways that are safe and appropriate. No, it's really interesting because on the one hand, you have helped equip us, perhaps, to fight cystic fibrosis and cure disease, but some of the other things, I was between, what if this were used by bioterrorists? What if this were used to, in, you know, to destroy food crops, right? So how do we navigate this, and is there a precedent for navigating this in science? I think there is, actually. I, you know, I, I think the precedent that, that I think is closest to what we're talking about here is actually the, uh, what was called the Silomar meeting in 1975. It was uh, a meeting that was uh, this, to discuss the use of molecular cloning at that time. And people worried about applications of molecular cloning, making copies of DNA and doing that in bacteria. Would that be dangerous for humans and things like that? Um, and I think, you know, frankly, with any new technology, there's always the risk of inappropriate or, or, or dangerous uh, applications, and, and CRISPR is no different. But I do think that it's very important to be grappling with these issues now. And I, you know, I, a little anecdote that I, that I, uh, you know, that I think about in, in this context is when I was, uh, you know, at, um, at, at my sort of in the early, early uh, months of, of doing this work, realizing that, you know, I'm sort of this joy of discovery, really, you know, find, figuring this out and understanding how this worked and thinking it was really interesting and really cool, um, and then seeing the pace of science just increasing, you know, tremendously. It's hard to overemphasize it. I mean, now there's close to 2,000 publications in the scientific literature in the last four years that are using this technology, so the pace just took off, and I have this incredible, you know, discipline my professional life, going to work and you know, reading papers and talking to my colleagues and my students and all the people that were using this for various things. And then uh, going to PTA meetings and you know, going to you know, school functions with my son and his friends and their parents, most of them were not scientists, and realizing they had no idea about this, and realizing that you know, there was this you know, important uh, technology that people really needed to start to understand so they could think about how it might be used in the future. Um, what I'm going to do in about mics on either side and I'll invite you down with but I want to, before I do that, come away from the ethical dimension for just a moment and come to this notion that we could be on the threshold of really revolutionizing medicine because of all of this. Close your eyes for, this, for a moment and imagine where this could take us. And presuming that we can navigate through some of this ethical swamp, what if the world could look like?
for producing uh, chemicals that are that are you know produced in a sustainable fashion. I think these are all areas where we're likely to see big advances. And what about, for example, with driving genes for malaria carrying mosquitoes? Right. It could render them um, extinct and the disease as well. Yeah, that's right. Something called gene drive.
in embryos were we to want to use it that way. But I do think that at least where we are right now, you know, we don't understand, for the most part, enough about the human genome and the interactions between genes to know how to make changes that would have enhancements that might be uh, desirable in, in the vast majority of, of cases. But I do think that will change over time, and especially now that you know, research is beginning using this in embryos in some jurisdictions, that will you know, drive forward our understanding, and that will, I think, certainly motivate people to want to use it clinically in some settings. Let me invite you to move to the microphone, and I'm going to turn to some of your questions. And this does not, not look like a shy audience. And so you're there first. Why don't you identify yourself? And if we can keep the questions fairly short, we can get as many in as we can in the remaining time. Go ahead. Joanne Orovec from the University of Wisconsin. I've got intellectual property related questions about how corporations, uh, other entities might profit from this research. And given the huge investment of our nation, the National Science Foundation, other uh, agencies in this uh, gambit, uh, is that fair? Uh, maybe we as a nation should somehow benefit and not allow uh, corporate entities, whatever, profit making organizations uh, to exude profit. And well, if, if changes are made to my genome, will I have to uh, pay over time like a subscription in order to keep, <laughs> keep living? So thank you so much for your research. Uh, wow, where to start with that one? Um, start with corporations <laughs> and profit. You know, I, th I mean, I guess the short answer to that question is that right now, in, you know, for academic researchers like me, uh, the intellectual property that's created during research owned by our universities. So it's the universities that, you know, basically are responsible for filing patents and then defending those patents and licensing those patents. And as you probably appreciate, you know, having patent protection has, you know, has long been appreciated as being very important for commercialization and, you know, you know, am I in my own lab going to be able to develop a therapeutic from this? You know, the answer is no, we don't have the resources or the, you know, the, the wherewithal to do that. It really has to be done in the context of a commercial entity, and they won't be interested in doing it unless they know they can ultimately make a profit. So, you know, that's sort of our, our, our standard patent system. But I think you're right to bring up this point about, you know, how sh it's, sort of a, it's sort of a rhetorical question, but one that we're thinking about. How should publicly funded science um, be, you know, how should profits from that be uh, fed back to the public? Go ahead, sir. Uh, given the potential for abuse of this technology, do you see any way that there might be a countermeasure? Is there a way to interfere with the action of CRISPR to recognize, et cetera, um, in, in some way? My name is Martin Apple, and I'm the past president of this Council of Scientific Society Presidents. Um, I would think the logical approach for us to take here is to say that it, we can do certain medical goods in humans, and that should be number one priority. And we've exhausted that possibility. Give us how many years it takes to do that. We can then have developed the time to develop an adequate standard of ethics and to make that standard of ethics worldwide. Rather than speculate on it now, take an elbow here and a finger there and so forth and everybody do something different. This is one time in human history in which we really have to have a universal standard of ethics agreed to and we haven't gotten there. But we can do a lot of good on the way and that can set the groundwork for doing it. Yeah, the question or? <laughs> Um, uh, I, 
I think I understood, I, I'm, I'm, I don't have any scientific background in this area, so I think I understood what you were explaining about the, um, the cutting part um, of the, two, there's two phases, and then the second phase was somehow either the two um, uh, loose ends connected to each other, or they connected via some kind of a designed <coughs> bridge sequence, and either you didn't really explain that or I somehow missed all that, so I, I don't know how you get that little bridge sequence in there after you've done the clipping. Yeah, well, that's it's actually a great question, and I didn't, I didn't explain where that comes from, but um, it really can be introduced in a couple of ways. One is by the experimenter putting that piece of DNA into the cell so that it can be incorporated during the process of repair, or sometimes cells, and this is what they do naturally, is they, if there is a piece of DNA in the cell that has a match, a sequence of letters that matches the site that got cut, they can actually use that as the source insertion of a new sequence. And that actually is a process that often happens naturally in cells, like during DNA uh, replication or cell division. But so it can come from inside the cell or externally. Thank you for a fascinating presentation. Um, I've got a couple of uh, technical uh, questions. Um, one is that you mentioned for sickle, treatment of sickle cell syndrome, you could remove an aliquot of blood, treat it with CRISPR, give it back to the patient, but then Blood cells overturn. Okay, so so that'd be a sort of a temporary fix. Uh, related to that, um, do you see that there will be a possibility to do to do CRISPR editing at the uh, gamete stage? Okay, so your first question was, how does this work if we edit blood cells that are going to turn over? And you're right. And so the way that this would be used therapeutically is by editing blood stem cells. Right, so these are the cells that have proliferative properties. Hi, Flora Lehrman, and I was wondering what are the predictions that the scientific community might have for how the edited genes will withstand the longitudinal effects of epigenetics? Um, well, I don't know how to, quite how to answer that. I mean, I think that um, if you're talking about, you know, how will they how will they respond to? Are you talking about methylation that might turn them off or something? Yeah. yeah. Um, well, it's interesting that you know what. So, in, in a you know just a sort of anecdotal uh, kind of answer to that question, experiments that I've done with a colleague at Berkeley, uh, Dirk Hoffmeyer, in, in human stem cells, what we're seeing is that you know when you make uh, changes to those cells, there are uh, epigenetic uh, modifications that occur sometimes to those inserted genes <coughs> that turn them off. And so, I think certainly that's obviously going to have to be an active area of research to understand what happens to genomes that get edited and how is the new information in those genomes you know, controlled by epigenetic modification. I don't really think we know the answer yet, or I don't know the answer. Sir. What, uh, what I guess, uh, innovations do you hope to see in the next generation of, of research into this? Um, and I guess a second question would be, what, what uh, new types of businesses do you I guess expect or hope to see evolve from this kind of um, kind of like 23andMe evolved from uh, you know the mapping of you know, whatnot. Yeah. Well, I think I think that you know sort of very broadly speaking, I think we'll see um, a couple of kinds of, of businesses. One is sort of technology companies that will build on this and new things that come along and sort of are in this kind of super family of, of proteins that do. Um, make DNA modifications and you know, companies that will sort of develop those as platform technologies. And then I think we'll see you know, companies that are actually specializing in applications, whether it's in agriculture, uh, whether it's in uh, therapeutics. Um, there's a new company that's involved in, um, in, in, in animal modification to make animal uh, organs that are 
better for organ donation. You know, I think there will be a lots of creative things that people come up with to use this to do. There's even a company I heard about recently that is making, trying to make a hypoallergenic cat. So <laughs> stay tuned to that one. The naming opportunities there are really quite fun. <laughs> I'm hoping we have time for just one more question. So, sir, that's yours. Thank you. Um, I'm going to try to draw an analogy between this and years ago when uh, there was this whole issue about um, embryonic stem cells and what could be used for research and what couldn't. And that was tied up in a, in a very volatile issue, which was abortion. And this is not. But the government chose, if I'm choosing the right word, to regulate that. And there were permissible things you could use, and there were non-permissible things. Is anyone moving in that direction? Although this is a very different area that doesn't involve all those those issues, it still has lots of ethics. Is anyone moving in the direction of trying to regulate this from a government point of view? Well, that's probably more of a question for John Holden than for me. But I, you know, again, I guess what I come back to is that uh, it, it, it's hard to regulate. I think right now. I mean, certainly, um, you may know that, that federal funding is not cannot be. But that being said, you know, if a, if a private uh, foundation or state money were to be uh, employed for that, that would not be illegal in this country. And um, and so, you know, how to how to grapple with the challenges that may come up going forward, given that sort of situation, I think it's a, a fascinating question. I've actually been already a couple times to the Office of Science and Technology Policy to discuss that issue, and it's, it, I think it really has to be an ongoing conversation. Jennifer, before I hand this over to Dave and we, and we, we pack it into the night, I, I want to ask you to sort of reflect on, 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 a, on a personal scientific level for all of us. We, to hear so much about the joy of discovery and the amazing moments. Would you take us back to when this was all getting real <laughs> for you and what you thought about and what you reflected upon if you did that you were about to unlock here or, or, or help you unlock? Well, it's like, you know, I, I guess when I reflect back on it, I, again, I feel like I, I just reflect on the very humble origins of, of this. You know, that you know, this was really a, as you maybe saw from the way I presented this, you know, a curiosity-driven project. It was being worked on by just a, a few people in my laboratory at the time, and a few people in, in labs uh, elsewhere. So it was a really small field of people, and um, and I think for me, uh, you know, just getting to the point where we understood that bacteria have evolved an incredible machine for you know, recognizing viral DNA and destroying it. First of all, it was just that was the pure joy of discovery. Just, wow, that's so amazing that nature does that. And it's so cool. I just thought that was really an interesting thing about bacteria. But then, you know, for me, making that connection to how it could be harnessed as a technology was was um, you know sort of just a, a moment of, of you know taking understanding and realizing that it could be connected to something that you never imagined would it would be connected to. And that's something I've always liked about science. You know, I just I think that's really fun is that you know you could be working over here and suddenly realize that your, your results or your insights have to do with something over here. And you know, and I think this is really an example where that was the case. And you know, it was just that that sort of proverbial moment of you know, chatting in my office with Martin Jinnett, the guy that was actually doing this work in my lab, and um, realizing that you know this could be a really interesting technology. And the two of us, you know, literally kind of looking at each other and you know feeling the, the hairs on the back of my neck because it really seemed like an exciting moment. So. Well, I hope you share that with your students and the others who come through your lab. So thank you so very much. Thank you. Sense of wonder. That's the, that's the second time it came up today, which I think is wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Doudna. Thank you, John Holdren, for all your good work. 
Um, thank, thank you, the Carnegie Institution, for hosting this magnificent place. And thank you all for coming tonight. Good night. How are you? Yes, yeah, in the office of the director. Oh, perfect. Yeah. 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 Wow. How are you? Fine. Do you think there are possibilities here for. Uh, oh, yeah, absolutely. I think the, so.